first of all, thanks for coming uh, for the last, thanks for uh, staying here so long for the last talk of the, of the event, except for the, for the wrap-up talk. Um, my name is Victor, I'm a kernel engineer at Red Hat, um, and uh, I'm working mostly in uh, kernel tracing, or observability, if you will, and I'd like to talk a bit about something I've been, well, I've tried to do uh, a, a while ago, and I told myself, what happens if I try to observe all the kernel functions at once? And today I'd like to share with you the results of my observations and maybe teach you something new, hopefully. Um, first of all, I'd at least let me uh, ask quickly a question. How many kernel engineers do I have here? Okay, so it's mostly non-kernel engineers, fine. Uh, I hope the session will not be too deeply technical uh, for you, but hopefully not. Um, okay, so. Let's get into it. Um, so first of all, let's start. Why would we want to do this? Why would we want to, you know, trace or observe all the kernel functions at once? Um, one of the problems with uh, debugging or tracing events being done in the kernel is that you need to have at least some often very significant knowledge of kernel internals. You need to know uh, when you are running a process, a command, you want to know what the kernel is doing while your process is running, you need to have some knowledge of the kernel in order to know which subsystems are affected, which functions are probably being run, where to place your hooks to the dynamic events or static events or whatever, uh, so that uh, you actually get some useful data out of your kernel tracing. Um, but sometimes you have no clue about what's going on in the kernel, especially if you're not, you, if you're not a kernel expert, you have no idea what's going on in the kernel, and Sometimes you would like to know what's going on. So one idea or solution to that would be, let's attach to all the functions in the kernel and let's see what happens. Let's see which functions take place, which functions are executed. Ideally, let's get us some more data about the functions, right? How long are the functions running? Um, what's the order of the functions? Which function is calling which function, et cetera, et cetera. So this is the goal of my talk, to enable or to see what current state of the art if it enables us to do this. There's a number of tools for tracing the Linux kernel. Uh, I'm gonna show my experiments or I've been exper experimenting with uh, three of them or, well, I've been experimenting with perf, ftrace and a couple of tools based on the BPF technology. I know there's plenty more tools to debug the Linux kernel, trace the Linux kernel. However, I think that's, that these three if we take the BPF-based tools as one, but it's a group of tools in, in fact, these three are the most widely used ones, so that's why, why I chose them. Every, uh, every one of these tools has its uh, advantages, disadvantages, I'm gonna talk about them, and um, it, they always, or almost always generate some overhead, so I'm, I'm gonna also speak about uh, the overhead that is generated while you are tracing your, your commands. Um, we are try to explore these tools, how they can achieve what I've been talking about. They also come with different uh, configurations because each of, each of these tools is already uh, very, has a lot of functionality, so we'll explore at least some of these different uh, configurations of the tools. Um, and in order to get some, something like, uh, some sense before, between the individual tools, we'll try to uh, come up with a running example, which we'll use throughout the entire presentation. And for that I will do, I will use a simple dd command which basically copies data. Uh, and I will copy some 250 megabytes of data from, um, hope you can see the pointer, from uh, def random to some new file called random. Uh, and we can see that if we are, so I, I was, I'm, everything I was running on my local laptop with standard x86 laptop. And we can see that it ran without any additional load, it, it ran for something over one second. This, that's our benchmark, which we will compare to throughout the entire presentation. So try to remember the one second um, length of the, of the command. Uh, and we'll show how we can use the tools I just mentioned uh, to determine or to find out which kernel functions are called by our process. And if possible, additional information such as in which order they are called, uh, what are the call stacks, what are the run times, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, without uh, much prolonging this, let's get into the first tool, and that's perf. So perf uh, is a performance analysis tool for Linux. It's developed as a part of the kernel uh, source tree, 
And uh, so at the beginning, uh, I think that at the beginning it was created uh, to uh, give users access to performance counters, both software and hardware ones, but over the time it grew into a really complex tool which allows a lot of functionalities for tracing or uh, measuring performance of both the kernel and the user space. There's a, lot of perf uh, there's a lot of counters built in, there are now static trace points, there are some dynamic events such as k-probes and u-probes, and much, much, much more. Uh, if you run perf help, it will give you a list of some 20 commands which are available. For our talk, there are three the most important ones. The first one is the perf record, which will uh, run a command, we will run our command obviously, and it will record a so-called profile. A profile is uh, something so in, the, in this mode, when you are running perf record, uh, perf is doing so-called sampling, which means that at a given frequency, it basically wakes up, collects some information, and then goes back to sleep. And it does this uh, in some frequency, and then aggregates all the data that it captured at the end and gives you some overview of the data that it captured while your command is, uh, was running. You can read this profile with two, basically two commands. One is perf report, which will open a nice interactive editor where you can, or interactive viewer of the results. And then the second one is perf script, which will re read the data directly, but uh, you can use that to pipe the result into some other tool, post-process the data, visualize. I will, I will show an example of that. Okay, so um, if we run the default perf record uh, command, so perf record and our command, uh, the first thing we notice is that there's no overhead. It still runs slightly over one second. So this profiling done by perf is very efficient. Um, and it will collect all the functions that are, it will, every, on, on each frequency, it will check the kernel and the user space stack, collect all the functions that are located on those stacks, and uh, aggregate them in, in the result, in the, in the profile. Then you can see the profile uh, by perf report, for instance, if you want to, it will by default uh, collect functions from user space as well. If we are only interested in kernel functions, we can do a filtering with this minus the option and it will give us the list of all the kernel functions that it saw during the runtime uh, of our command and uh, it will display some additional information such as for instance overhead. So it's interesting, we can see that here in our case, this is the most so-called hot function. Uh, so the, in, in 40, almost 41% of the kernel stacks that it saw, there was a function called cha cha per mute. So it, it's probably a function which is actually doing some work while, while we are running our, um, running our tool. Um, okay, so this is some basic information. There are some advantages. Obviously, there's almost no overhead, so it's great. Uh, we can easily see which functions are hot, so if, if this is sufficient for you, then this is the way to go. But um, there are some disadvantages. The first one is, this is based on sampling. Sampling means, as I said, you have some time interval in, in which you are checking some information. In case there is, for instance, some function called it being in between your frequencies, so, uh, and, and if it succeeds to run uh, as the entire, then you will never get that function. So you may be actually losing data, you know, because um, since you are just profiling, you are just doing something at some frequency, you are not getting all the functions that are called, just those that have been there at the time you have looked at the kernel stack. So you may be missing events. Um, and if you are interested in these events, then you can actually use perf, or not, at least not reliably. Uh, and second, it's quite hard to get some additional information out of that. You don't have, get any information uh, like uh, any relation between the functions, no, no, no function runtimes, etc. One option how to fix that is to use so-called uh, uh, or is to uh, collect stack traces instead of functions uh, by adding the minus G option to perf record, which will not collect only individual functions, it will collect the entire stack traces, and then you can post-process these stacks. You can either visual, uh, see them directly by perf script, or you can post-process them via various tools or visualize them, and one of the very nice visualizations that I know of is uh, our so-called flame, flame graphs introduced by Brendan Gregg, uh, in case you are not familiar with this, so uh, this is one flame graph of our execution of the DD tool. The, the width of the chart is the entire runtime of the process. And we can see, so we can see that at the bottom we have DD, so it was running 100% of time, obviously. And then we have these small, let's say, pyramids 
Uh, this one is for reading, so basically DD command is doing two things, right? It's reading some data and then it's writing some data. So this, this, this pyramid is for reading the data uh, and this one is for writing. So we, we can already observe some interesting information here, right? For instance, we can see that actually writing takes half of the time than reading. So reading from def random takes twice, twice as, as, uh, as much time as writing to a file because you know the width of the column is roughly twice, uh, twice larger. Uh, we can also see our function, which we have observed in the previous example, the cha cha permute function. We can see that it's really running quite a lot of time. It sort of corresponds to the 41% that we have seen, at least visually. And, but now we can also see some, some relation between the functions. We can see that the cha cha permute was called by cha cha block generic. That one is called by get random by its user, et cetera, et cetera. So we can see actually which can, function is calling which function as it goes up. Okay, so. Um, Obvious uh, advantages, I didn't see the runtime of the command, but there's still no overhead, trust me. Uh, and we can already see some relations between functions. Uh, the disadvantages, it's still sampling, we still may be losing events, and it's still hard to get some additional information. For instance, if we wanted to know how long each function, for how long each function ran, we wouldn't be able to extract the information from, from perf. So in order to overcome the, the last point, uh, let's use another technology. Let's use ftrace. ftrace is a kernel internal function tracer, uh, which was originally designed to help kernel engineers debug the Linux kernel. However, it's these days it's usable for tracing the, the kernel as well. Um, it supports a lot of features besides play, plain function tracing, which was the original purpose of, of ftrace. Uh, one of the disadvantages is that it's um, the the interaction is a bit complicated uh, if you're not a kernel engineer who are more used to this. Uh, normally, if you want to interact with ftrace, you have to interact with uh, uh, the so-called tracefs file, a pseudo file system, which is typically mounted at syskernel tracing. So you are basically writing and reading from the files mounted at syskernel tracing, and this is the way you interact with ftrace. Uh, fortunately, if you don't want to do this, uh, there are more, more convenient ways. For instance, there's a trace CMD command, which is basically an envelope over the ftrace uh, system. However, I will be using the, the traditional way of, of uh, interacting directly with uh, syskernel tracing. So let's start with uh, tracing all the functions. Let's see what functions are actually called. Um, we do it by uh, running th these commands. So first of all, we will need to enable the so-called function tracer by writing the word function to this file, to the current tracer file. Then one problematic thing is that uh, it's a bit complicated with ftrace to actually trace only the functions ran by our command. We'll do a trick. Uh, ftrace allows you to filter uh, the functions it's observing by PID. So we will write the PID of the current process to the ftrace filter. And then we will start the tracing. And then we will execute by our command by running exec, which will basically replace the current shell with our command. So the PID will be the same and therefore uh, ftrace will successfully capture only the functions which are run by, by our uh, process. So this is the trick we will use to actually make ftrace uh, collect only functions um, used by our uh, uh, command. And then we can see the result. We can see the result by uh, checking the uh, file trace, and now it's no longer sampling, it's tracing. So ftrace uh, basically hooks to the entry of every function, and if a function was executed during the runtime of our process, it will be here. We have no lost functions. One thing we can see, if I go back, there is over already an overhead. It took ftrace, or it took the command, took something over four seconds to run, with ftrace being attached to all the functions. So there is already some overhead. However, we, we are not losing any, any events anymore. We, we are getting everything. The output looks like this. It's, it might be a bit unstructured, but it already has some useful data. For instance, we can see the timestamps, so we can see in which order the functions were run. We can also see the caller of the function. It's the one uh, after the arrow, so we can see which function called the function we are tracing. At, at, the, at the particular line, there are some additional flags, the CPU, uh, there's a na name of the task and the PID of the process, which obviously is only our task because it's the only thing we are tracing, but it doesn't have to be that way. You can be tracing multiple processes, so it can be useful. 
Um, still, there was not much useful information or much structured information, but as I said, there are no events lost. There are already timestamps. There is overhead, so we have to count that it will slow down the runtime of our command. It may be different from different commands, but for my command, for the DD command, the overhead was almost or four and a half times, something like that. Um, and the information is sort of basic. You can get, for instance, the number of times a function was called, but you don't get much more information. Luckily, ftrace has another feature, which is called function graph tracer. So instead of writing function, we will write a function graph, so choose a function graph tracer. Then the rest is the same, except for the second point, where we have to specify an entry point. So what this graph tracer will do, it will give us the complete call graph of all the functions in the order they were called, uh, including time, uh, runtime timestamps. Uh, but we need to set an entry point. So we need to specify a kernel function from which we will start capturing the, the call trace. Uh, how do we get the, the function we are interested in? Well, we could go back to perf, check what perf told us is actually being run, and we could see that in the, in the read part of, of the thing, there's a, a kernel function called cases read. So for instance, let's trace that one. Let's, let's use that one as the entry, and then let's see the whole kernel stack. The result in return will look something like this, which is very nice. We can see that uh, our function was called, and then once it was, it was called, we can see every single kernel function that was called. They are nicely indented, so you can see that cases read uh, called fjet post, then it finished in 0.1 microseconds, then that, uh, it called VFS read, then VFS read called RW verify area, then that one called security file permissions, etc., etc. Every time a function ends, you can see it you know, by this uh, closing brace indented to the same column as the function that was started. Uh, you also get the runtime. So we can see that, for instance, security file permissions uh, permission ran for 1.3 microseconds. So this is already a very interesting information. If you have no idea on what's going in the kernel, you can use this function graph tracer, uh, and you, you know at least which function to start with. You can use this function graph tracer to get a very concrete idea or very concrete trace of which exact kernel functions were called in which order, what time it took them, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, so okay, this is, these are the uh, advantages. Uh, disadvantages, obviously, then you need the entry point, but you can use, for instance, perf to get the one. And there's already some overhead. Uh, sorry, I didn't highlight it. It took ftrace 6.1 seconds, so it's already a bit, even a bit slower than than uh, uh, than uh, the normal function trace. Okay. Um, one thing that ftrace cannot do is that it cannot, if you need even more information about the functions that you are running, for instance, if you need, uh, I don't know, a thread ID, or you need to know which C groups are mounted, or in which C groups the process is running, or you need some to access some kernel memory, et cetera, et cetera, then ftrace is usually not sufficient to do that. And what is sufficient to do that are tools based on so-called BPF technology. Uh, I hope, at you are at least familiar with the technology, at you at least know that it exists, but let me quickly summarize what eBPF is. eBPF, also called BPF, so let's, see, let's say it's the same thing, it's a Linux technology which allows you to basically run so-called sandbox programs in the kernel context. Uh, there, there's a couple of use cases, among others tracing, which is the thing we are interested in here, and the way you, you, do, is, you do this is you write BPF programs in so-called BPF instructions, which are then just in time compiled inside the kernel. There's a couple of tools using BPF. Uh, I'm gonna show my examples on two of those. One is libbpf, which is uh, uh, the most used user space library used for, kernel, uh, for, for uh, interacting with BPF. It's uh, developed directly in the Linux kernel source tree, but it's, it's a user space library. It has a lot of features. Uh, it has practically all the features that are currently available in BPF. Uh, then there's BCC, which, is, which stands for BPF Compiler Collection, which allows you to write parts of uh, things in Python, but I'm not gonna get, get into much details with that one. But there's also BPF Trace, which is a very nice tool, which comes with its own domain-specific language, which uh, will, if you know SystemTab or DTrace, 
it's very similar to that, and it will allow you to very easily specify what you want to trace. It will create a BBF program for you and, and run it. There's a lot more tools. These are just like the basic ones, and uh, obviously I don't have time to, to go into much more tools. Feel free to check those out. Okay, uh, before going into the tools themselves, let's see the basic operation of um, BPF tools. So normally how you do this is you create a BPF program in a high level language. You are not writing it directly with the instructions. You usually use, for instance, C if you're writing in libbpf or domain specific language for BPF trace for our two examples, which is then compiled into the BPF instructions, which are then loaded into the kernel. Then you usually usually uh, also uh, write a user space program which will collect the information from your BPF program, aggregate it and somehow typically present it to the user. Um, and then you attach your BPF program to various events in the kernel. There's a number of events available. Uh, for instance, there are static trace points which are di compiled directly in the kernel. There are so-called k-probes and k-red probes, which are dynamic events, which, will, which allow you to intercept basically every function in the, in the kernel, uh, including placing probes in the middle of the function or in the return of the function. Uh, there are BPF-specific events uh, so called f-entry and f-exit for tracing so-called function boundaries, so tracing entries and exits from the programs. And there's many, many more. I will, I will present some of those. Once you have your BPF program attached, it will fire or it will be executed every time that specific event is hit. Typically, it will collect the data you're interested in. It will send it to the user space program and the user space program will process the data, aggregate it, present it to the user, to you, so that you see what you actually collected. Um, okay, uh, so now let's see some of the BPF-based tools, but let's not go into the tools by individual. Instead, we will go into the, we'll see how we can use the individual attach points or events for tracing all the kernel functions at once. The first obvious choice, if you don't know much about BPF, would be to use BPF specific events, right? F entry and F exit. If we try to do that, and I will be using BPF trace command here, so let me first explain the BPF trace command. So we have BPF trace command. BPF trace has this nice feature where you can uh, say, I want to execute this process by uh, saying minus C and the, the command to run. So this is our command here. And BPF trace will execute that command for you and trace only events happening in that command by, uh, well, you can do that by uh, adding a filter to your, to your probe. So this, the second line is our probe, uh, which says, the filter says, we only want to see our filter events only if our PID, the PID of our current process, equals to the child PID, to the PID of the process BPF trace is running for us, the DD command. So we only want to see the functions executed uh, by, the, by our process. And what we will do here, we will attach not to all functions, but only to functions uh, starting with this prefix. So it's basically all the functions serving syscalls. It's some, we can see, 435 functions. Not all of them. By the way, in kernel, there are some like 50 to 70,000 functions these days. So this is the amount of functions we are talking about here. Uh, so, but here we, are, we will only use the 400 ones and we will collect for each function. This says for each function, tell me how many times it has been called. Uh, why I'm showing this is that we can see that the overhead is already s quite large, let's say 5.6 seconds, so it's five times larger, but I'm running this in the time command and you can see that the entire command took some one minute and 43 seconds. Uh, the problem is that the rest of the time, uh, while the DD command was not running, was spent in attachment of the probes. The problem is that these F entry and F exit probes are not really designed for mass attachment. So I advise you not to use them uh, because there are some technical problems and because of this, it's not their purpose actually. So do not try to use them because it, it will be very slow. The attachment will be very slow. If you try to do that for all the functions, you may, you may as well hang your system. So luckily we have other uh, concepts which will allow us to do this. The second obvious option would be K-probes, especially the kernel developers which have been around for a long time. No K-probe, it's been, it's been in the kernel for a long time. Unfortunately, attaching too many K-probes at the same time is sort of unstable and it may crash your kernel. For instance, BPF trace 
has a limitation of a, a maximum 500k probes attached at the same time. I did try to attach uh, some 50,000 k probes to my system and I successfully crashed my kernel. So I don't advise you to, to do that. Fortunately, there are other options. And the other option are so-called multi-k probes. This is something that has been added to the kernel 518 by Yuri Olsha. And despite the name, which says k probes, they are not based on k probes. They are based on so-called f probes, which is an f trace mechanism. So it's not rel related to k probes. And it actually is specifically designed to attach a single BPF program to a lot of functions. So it's exactly serving our purpose here. Let's see how they perform. Luckily, BPF trace now uses them by default. So if you write K probe, so this is very, very similar to what we have seen, except for this part. If you write K probe colon star, it will try to use the K probe multi or multi K probes and attach them to all the kernel functions of your running kernel. Then the command will execute, it will collect the data. There will be a lot of data because a lot of functions were called, but we can see, for instance, that our cha cha permit function, which we have seen in the beginning, uh, was run 4,668 times. So you already get some very nice and detailed information out of this. Unfortunately, the overhead is there. It's 150 times overhead. Uh, so it is slow. However, in return, you get a lot of interesting data. BPF programs really allow you to collect pretty much anything you want to know about the function, about the process, about the system at, the, at that point when the event is hit, you can somehow get it. Um, if you don't use BPF trace, because BPF trace is doing some, is generating some overhead by itself, and use only libbpf, I'm not showing the entire program because it's quite long, but this is the idea. You will use, you will use a special section um, macro and say that we, I want to attach this program to all the multi-k probes and then you will write your BPF program here. If you use that, you will uh, get to some 80 times overhead. So it's, it's already much better. Unfortunately, this was only for probe entries. So we are only tracing entries to the functions. Once we want to add also exits of the functions, for instance, to be able to measure the runtime, Ftrace is doing that, I know, but you want, might want to do this in, in, uh, in BPF then you will get into more trouble because the overhead is pretty much the same. You just use k-red probe here, but you can see the overhead for yourselves. The reason is that tracing returns is inherently harder than tracing uh, entry points because you have only single entry point into a function while you might have quite a lot of returns from the function. So there must be some technical things done uh, in order to be able to achieve tracing of, of the exits. And uh, unfortunately, the thing I found out while I was experimenting with this, that it's actually broken. So if you compile the latest kernel and try to, try to attach to all the k-red probes at the same time, you will get it out of memory error. It's not allocating that much space. I tried, I raised the, um, raised the memory limit, to, sorry, the memory to the VM to some 20 gigabytes, it still got out of uh, uh, OOM error. I think there is an error. I think it could be fixed very easily. So hopefully it fixes on the way. Uh, anyways, I, I, I did fix it uh, for my kernel, and, but I, I could see that the overhead was quite large. Uh, one of the reasons why this overhead exists is that uh, this is quite a new technology. And one of the things it's doing is that when you are trying to create, a, you usually, if you want to use this, you will need to create two programs, right? One, one for the entries, one for the exits, and while the programs will be very, very similar, because they usually want to collect the same data, because you are collecting something. Um, but you, you need to have two programs, and there will be sort of two BPF links and all the technical details I, I don't want to go into, but it will generate some overhead. Fortunately, there is a new feature coming, also implemented by Yuri, which will appear in kernel 6.10, so the next kernel release. And it's called so-called session k-probes, again based on f-probes, not k-probes, despite the name. Uh, which will allow you to write a single program for both the entry and the exit of the function and use the uh, multi-attachment uh, thing to reduce the overhead. Uh, so you basically now will be writing just one program and you can use this uh, nice function, a BPF session is return, from which we can, the program can tell if it is inside the entry probe or inside the exit probe and you can actually use that to, uh, you know, distinguish the two. 
and the overhead wheel degrees. Okay, uh, to sum it up for BPF tools, there's a great versatility. You can access pretty much anything you want, you, you want to know about the process. There's actually quite a low overhead if you're tracing a small number of functions, of functions. I didn't show that, but there is. But there's quite a large overhead, as we have seen, if you're tracing a lot of all the functions. Uh, also, you are often dealing with blending edge technology here, so you may be expecting bugs to occur. Okay, so um, I know I'm over time, sorry about it, but uh, I, I just want to go through this one slide, uh, which is probably the most important slides of this presentation. So how do you choose your tracing tool? First of all, um, think about what kind of information you need. If you need only basic information, such as which functions are run, uh, use perf or ftrace and consider the overhead versus precision sampling versus tracing trade-off. If you need more information, use BPF. But first, use perf or ftrace to get to know which functions are actually run by your command with a rel relatively low overhead, and then only attach to those functions in your BPF programs, which will generate significantly less overhead, and you can use all the features that BPF al uh, allows you to do <coughs> and extract all the ni nice information you want to know about your your probe or your, your program, the kernel function, et cetera. If, when it comes to choosing the BPF tools, uh, I recommend you to either use or get inspired by one of the existing tools. As a first choice, I'm always going to BPF trace because it has this nice domain specific language. Check it out, the presentation will be, will be uh, available. So there's the link for to BPF trace. It's also packaged in most of the distros. Um, there's also, if, if you don't want to use BPF trace, I recommend using, using libbpf. Uh, either, for instance, there's a very nice uh, tool by Andri, uh, which is called Redsnoop, which is actually aimed at mass tracing the kernel, so it already by default tries to attach to a lot of probes at the same time. Uh, or, but if, or if you still insist on writing your own BPF tool, I would recommend to start with this nice libbpf bootstrap repo, which has a demo of a couple of BPF applications which you can start with. And that's it. Uh, last thing is just a couple of things to watch for. Uh, there are some patch sets uh, which could be merged in the, in the kernel in, in the following uh, months or days. Uh, one is that uh, people are trying to re-implement f-probes on function graphs, so they, the f-probes actually might get a low overhead, hopefully. Uh, there will be BPF trace for support for K-probe sessions. It's not there yet. There are some uh, improvements or, or user space tracing done by, Yiri, done by Yiri. I didn't mention user space tracing at all, but if you're interested, check his work out and much, much more. And that's it. Sorry I uh, over overtook or uh, it took so long. I know there's been a lot of information. Uh, check this uh, presentation um, as a reference. If you want to trace a lot of kernel functions, uh, feel free to go back to the presentation, check the, check the tools, check the commands. Feel free to reach out to me uh, if you want to, uh, if you need some help with your tracing. That's it. Thank you for the attention and I'm happy to take questions. Yes, question. Um, I didn't measure that. Yeah, sorry. Uh, the question is, what's the maximum frequency of perf and what is the actual overhead if you use it? To be honest, I didn't think about measuring that, so I also don't know what's the maximum frequency. I know the default one is 4,000 hertz. Uh, I'm not really sure what's the maximum one. Maybe some more ex experts in the room will know. I think we have one minute, so maybe time for one more question. Yes. Yes. Uh, yeah, me neither. Sorry, the question was. Um, the question was that if uh, uh, the program you're tracing with perf or uh, sampling with perf is not actively running on a CPU, it's sleeping or something like that, it's not visible in the default perf uh, profile. Um, 
I'm not a perf expert as well, so I'm not really sure. I would say that uh, yes, there there would be an option to configure this in perf because it has so many configuration options these days, but I'm not really sure and I didn't really try. Okay, I think we're at the end, so thank you for the attention and hope you enjoy the conference. Thank you.